<laughs> Hello, everyone. It's MLA Jackie Lovely from the Camrose constituency. And we're meeting today at Augustana campus at the University of Alberta, which is located at Asiniska CPC in Treaty 6 territory. And I'd like to thank the university for hosting us today for this exciting announcement. Now, I would be remiss if I did not stop and pause and take this opportunity to tell all of you who are not from the area that Camrose is a fabulous place to come and visit. If you want to have a staycation, this is the place to come and shop. We've got a fantastic main street just down here, straight down the street, where we've got all kinds of fabulous boutiques, men's and ladies. And then here is the Jean and Peter Lougheed Performing Arts Centre. We've got the Baileys just down the street, all kinds of hotels and restaurants, and you would really enjoy your stay here. So I hope that you all come back and just enjoy Enjoy some good Alberta hospitality. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome to the city of Camrose, Premier Jason Kenney. Everybody clap. <laughs> Service Alberta Minister Nate Glubish. Associate Minister of Rural Economic Development Nate Horner. Chief Billy Morin of Enoch Cree Nation. Paul McLaughlin, President of the Rural Municipalities of Alberta. And th thank you gentlemen so much for coming. And thank you to all of you for coming today as well and sharing your time with us because uh, today we have a very important announcement. And um, I've had the opportunity to spend just a teeny little bit of time with the Premier this morning. Um, but you know what? This is always a great place to come back to. We've got a little event happening this afternoon for the Premier but I'm not going to take any time because now we need to hear the important announcement. So thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Jackie, for welcoming us. It is also great to see the mayor uh, of Camrose and, and many community leaders appreciate being here at Augustana uh, campus of the University of Alberta. Great post-secondary institution with a deep history. In fact, I understand that uh, Dr. Dean Henshaw is an Augustana alumnus and uh, so one of the many uh, Augustan alumni who have done amazing work in public service and helping us to build Alberta uh, speaking of which great to be here at the Jean and Peter Lougheed Performing Arts Centre uh, Jean Lougheed having been growing up partly in Camrose as well so thank you very much uh, MLA Jackie Lovely and to everybody else for being here to participate in a very important announcement about job creation and economic growth part of Alberta's recovery plan Alberta is leading Canada out of the COVID crisis and leading our country in economic growth. Pretty much every major bank and think tank says that Alberta is leading Canada in economic expansion this year and projects that we'll do so again next year. And Lord knows we need that kind of growth. After five tough years of economic stagnation and getting hit by the triple whammy of the COVID crisis, the global recession, and the collapse in energy prices last year. Uh, it is fantastic to see the sun rising on Alberta and economic renewal happening in every industry right across our province. Uh, we are seeing fantastic uh, opportunity this year, best year ever in the Alberta forestry industry. Last year was the best year ever in terms of agricultural revenues, although this year there's, there's tough weather. Uh, and we're thinking of our farmers, uh, we're going to stand behind them as they get through this. Uh, this is the best year ever in the uh, film and television industry as we see a diversification of our economy. Of course, commodity prices are back strong and Alberta is set to create huge numbers of new jobs in industries like oil and gas, uh, but also expanding into mining and new industries like hydrogen. Uh, supporting infrastructure re to reduce emissions through things like carbon capture and storage. Um, but one of the industries where we see the strongest growth right now is in high tech, in innovation or digital uh, in businesses. Uh, we have seen the, the best year ever in venture capital investments. That money is the jet fuel for startup businesses, those little tech enterprises um, that are in so many ways the future of the world economy. Uh, and just in recent months, we've seen major announcements about uh, thousands of new jobs being created in the tech sector here in Alberta. Global giants like Infosys and Emphasis announcing thousands of new jobs in Alberta, uh, partnering with our universities like the U of A, 
because in part because of its uh, Center of Excellence for Artificial Intelligence and the University of Calgary with its Center for Quantum Learning. Uh, and just yesterday, Canada's largest bank, the Royal Bank of Canada, announcing that they will be locating a new national uh, innovation hub here in Alberta, uh, starting with at least 300 high-paying, high-tech jobs. That's why this is the best year on record uh, for high-tech, for the digital industry, um, for the innovation space. Uh, but we want to ensure that all Albertans in every region of our province benefit from the promise and potential of the digital economy. That helps us to diversify our economy, but also helps to uh, maintain and revitalize rural communities like Camrose. Uh, communities that are so much a part of our province's history and have to be a vital part of our future. Now, a lot of work has been done in Alberta over the years to ensure uh, that rural communities, uh, workers and businesses can benefit from digital technology. And uh, uh, th that's, I want to acknowledge those efforts that have been made in the past. Having said that, we continue to see that uh, Alberta, many rural Albertans are underserved when it comes uh, to broadband, uh, to wireless and to connectivity uh, to the digital economy. Right now, 12% of Alberta families, or approximately 200,000 households across Alberta, are lacking the speeds that the uh, federal government says are required for adequate internet service. This limits the ability of those communities to attract investment and participate fully in our growing digital economy, as well as to benefit from services like uh, digital health care, for example. And while 12% might sound like a, a small number, most of those homes are located in rural and indigenous communities which play a key role in our province. Right now about 80 percent of indigenous communities don't have access to reliable internet in our province. Roughly 67 percent of rural communities cannot rely on a stable internet connection and this just is no longer acceptable. Access to broadband uh, must help these, these Alberta communities continue to grow and participate in our economic recovery. So I am very excited to be here to announce that as a key part of Alberta's economic recovery plan, Alberta's government is dedicating at least $150 million to connect Albertans in rural, remote and indigenous communities uh, to high-speed internet, to broadband, to the digital economy. Uh, it, this is a fundamental part of our economic strategy and with this $150 million uh, initial investment, we believe we'll be able to secure additional federal funds uh, for rural, uh, remote and Indigenous uh, broadband connectivity and we'll be able to leverage even larger investments from the private sector uh, telecommunications companies um, as partners as we uh, move to, uh, we, we do everything we can to move towards 100% acceptable speed uh, of internet access for Albertans regardless of where they live. Uh, so this is a very exciting and important step forward. As I say, this is part of Alberta's recovery plan, a bold plan to build, to diversify and to create jobs. This includes the largest ever investments uh, by Alberta's government in building our, the architecture of our future economy, roads and highways, bridges, schools and hospitals and so much more. Twenty one billion dollars of capital investment over the next three years. It involves the job creation tax cut, which we accelerated while other jurisdictions are uh, raising taxes on job creators, we've reduced them. It includes our red tape reduction plan, where we've gone from an F to an A under the CFIB's red tape report card, uh, moving close to our goal of becoming the freest and fastest moving economy in North America. It includes all of our sector strategies to uh, ensure a strong future for our, st our historic industries in the resource sector, but also diversifying to ensure jobs for the future. So a very important announcement for communities like Camrose. And with that, I'm looking forward to uh, Ministers Glubish and uh, as well as Minister Horner in providing more details. Well, thank you, Premier, and thank you to everyone who has joined us this morning.
Uh, today we are fortunate uh, to be tapping into a robust broadband connection for our announcement, but this experience is not shared by everyone across the province. And so, by investing up to $150 million to support broadband expansion, Alberta's government is taking a big step to make sure that our rural, remote, and Indigenous communities, households, and businesses have the resources they need. One of the most consistent topics that I hear about uh, in my role as Minister of Service Alberta is frustration with unreliable connectivity and the need for a solution. Alberta first started working to ensure that all Albertans had better connectivity in 2001 with the launch of what is now called the Supernet, which meant that schools and health centers and libraries and government buildings had a stable connection. Over the next 20 years, Alberta spent approximately $1 billion to expand and maintain that service to more than 4,200 facilities in over 300 communities. Alberta started out ahead of the rest of the country. But our expansion slowed and stopped about 16 years ago in 2005. And where our province had been leading, we fell into line with other provinces. And today, we lag in our connectivity. And so two years ago, as a new minister, I toured this province to connect with Albertans and hear directly from them. Most of the communities I visited cited broadband connectivity as a primary concern. And the takeaway was the same. Albertans need access to stronger, faster internet connections. Those concerns are the same today. But today, as the Premier said, we are announcing up to $150 million of new funding to help resolve these concerns. A lack of connectivity impacts the lives of real Albertans and, in, and the communities that they live in. Many rural businesses have difficulty growing and expanding because a lack of connectivity makes it difficult, if not impossible, to effectively maintain an online presence. Many of these rural businesses are having to consider relocating to urban centers uh, in order to remain viable. Rural families pay well above urban market pricing for subpar internet speeds, and they can barely support the educational needs of their school-aged children. I saw the difficulties that rural communities were facing when trying to attract private investment, which so often hinges on access to broadband connections. Let me just say that internet access is no longer a luxury. And so with better access to broadband internet, we can see our GDP grow. We expect it to grow between 500 million and $1.7 billion with access to universal connectivity. Broadband revitalizes communities by attracting new businesses, creating jobs, building new real estate markets as urban Albertans seek quiet rural life with remote work opportunities that support meaningful careers. It will also help Albertans to make the most of investments that, are, that, that they already have in place. For example, broadband will enable agriculture technologies, increasing productivity through precision agriculture uh, with new tools that help hardworking farmers to get the most from their growing season. It will also help Alberta businesses improve efficiency and to see exponential growth. For example, Alberta's technology sector has seen more than 200% growth in the last decade, despite the economic challenges that our province has faced. And nearly 400 of those businesses are located in rural communities all across this province. Connectivity is what makes this growth possible. Broadband internet will also help Albertans access online learning resources to help build their skill sets and careers and to pre prepare them to reach their fullest potential in a modern economy. The benefits of connectivity extend to government services as well. With more government resources going to digital services, including recently launched online registry systems, faster broadband means that Albertans can access streamlined, more easy to use services when and how it is most convenient to them. While our goal is to make sure all Albertans can access broadband, I would like to specifically highlight the impacts it will have on Indigenous communities. As the Premier said, right now more than 80% of Alberta's Indigenous communities, including all eight Métis settlements, lack proper broadband connectivity. Improving access to broadband will support digital literacy and career growth in our First Nation and Métis communities, including Indigenous youth, which is one of the fastest growing demographics in Canada. This will help to build a stronger and more vibrant future for our entire province. While it is true that many families and businesses do not have reliable broadband, it is also true that there is incredible potential for Albertans if we can get this right. And over the past two years, I've seen a willingness within communities to lead the change we need. 
We have been working with other orders of government and the private sector to identify opportunities for investment and innovative ways to extend connectivity services to as many Albertans as possible. As the Premier mentioned, we have been in discussions with the federal government to explore ways to work together to expand connectivity across rural, remote and Indigenous communities all across this province. And we are optimistic that we'll have more to share with Albertans about that in the very near future. While there is no single solution to improving broadband, I am dedicated to finding results that work for Albertans. This investment of up to $150 million is a strong step towards ensuring that Alberta's recovery touches all corners of our province. I know that many of you will want to know how and where these dollars will be allocated, but those are decisions that will still be made, and I look forward to announcing that kind of material later. Today's announcement is, a great, is, is great news for rural communities, remote communities, and Indigenous communities all across Alberta, and I'm so excited to be a part of it. I'm also looking forward to working together with our new Associate Minister of Rural Development, Nate Horner, as we take concrete steps forward to expand connectivity. And I'd like to invite him now to provide some comments on the impacts this investment will have in our rural communities. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Minister Glubish. And I'd like to thank you for all the work you've done on this file for the past uh, two years. It's, it's been great to see. And as a rural Albertan, this is a very exciting day. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for this very exciting announcement. Rural Alberta has a bright future. Today's investment of up to 150 million will support our rural communities by improving connectivity and bring with it the potential for many exciting opportunities. As the MLA for Drumheller Stetler, I have some experience with slow rural internet speeds. Um, Camrose is what I would call the big city. You guys, <laughs> you guys have a casino. It's, uh, it's a common complaint. I hear from many constituents and I know their concerns are far from unique. Uh, during the pandemic, it was made very clear the, the problems that families had as schools moved from in-class learning to online and the difficulties that caused many school divisions and, and families. There's so much room for improvement and that's why this is so exciting. Slow internet speeds or no internet at all has become a fact of life for many Albertans. I want to thank the Premier and again Minister Glubish for recognizing the important role rural Alberta plays in our province's prosperity. Alberta's rural communities are a driving force in our province's economy. By investing in the improvement of broadband services, we are unleashing the potential of our rural economies. From retail and agriculture to tourism and the energy sector, the benefits of this investment will drive our economic recovery and create jobs for Albertans at a time when they need the most. In an increasingly connected world, access to high-speed internet has become a top priority for job creators. Alberta's government is committed to making our province the most competitive place to do business, and this investment is another step in the right direction. Rural communities with stronger internet will be in, be in a better position to attract the private sector investment needed to diversify local economies and create new jobs. This will help ensure the viability of our communities, big and small, for years to come. Improving access to broadband will also help create new markets and expand existing ones, such as agriculture and tourism. Imagine if tech companies creating new technology for the energy sector could set up next to their customers in the oil patch. Alberta farmers already utilize cutting edge technology, but imagine if farmers across, across the province could take it one step further to enhance their crop yields, adopt newer and safer tools, increasing profits and stimulating the local economy. These things create the momentum needed to diversify local economies, innovate existing sectors while attracting new ones across the province and allow Albertans to live anywhere while working for companies on Bay Street or Wall Street. Albertans looking to leave the city in favour of quieter towns may not have to choose between their career and their home. By investing in broadband expansion that connects our households, businesses and communities, Alberta's government is taking the necessary steps to protect rural Alberta's way of life. As connectivity grows, so will our economy and so will the opportunities presented to Albertans. So thank you all and I would now like to welcome Chief Billy Morin up to share his remarks.
Mio tips gal, mio geeks gal, katam skatano wal gakio nantoki tope nitsiko sin maskeg si oche. You know, in my travels as an indigenous leader um, to many great places across the world, uh, notably Dubai, Europe, um, uh, Southeast Asia, Australia, um, there was a common theme of successful countries and who were innovative, and it was a simple formula that said, uh, in today's world or the world going forward, uh, the successful communities just do uh, two things, capital and connectivity, capital and connectivity, capital and connectivity. And uh, I really took that away, so I'm really excited for today's announcement. Um, when you think about the capital and connectivity that's doing, uh, that's been announced today for Indigenous communities, um, it was said so much that you know it's going to affect uh, our young people in our schools because we had 20 laptops even donated to our school uh, last year, but the the connectivity uh, just wasn't there for the for them to be even be effective. And we're so close to the city, so I can't imagine how important this is going to be to those rural First Nations communities, not just First Nations, but the the towns like Camrose, the smaller communities up north, the smaller communities outside the two big municipalities. So, uh, really, really cool that this announcement's happening, and it's just. It's just foundational capital, uh, capital that's being invested through broadband that's going to make all the difference. You've got to start somewhere. And then the second thing is I look forward to the future. So we're having great discussions right now with Health City Edmonton. We're having great discussions with local health regional authorities on telehealth. Well, in order to get to those conversations around telehealth and how our elders and our, our people who really uh, have struggles coming into the city, Broadband and connectivity are going to help them bring those health services back into the First Nations communities themselves for healthy First Nation elders, healthy First Nation kids, healthier First Nations communities um, to move forward. Because again, the, the health systems have to evolve themselves. So this is foundational infrastructure that's going to take us into the 21st century, even in something uh, as foundational as the health sector. So a really exciting conversations around that. And then finally, I acknowledge like the campus that we're in, the city of Camrose, the Augustana campus, and I see that sign over there that says Corinne Lightning. Corinne Lightning's actually a lawyer, a U of A um, alumni. She actually works for the Enoch Cree Nation in some projects as a lawyer as well. But Corinne Lightning is the minority. And how many Indigenous students are, we mi are missing out and seeing themselves on an Augustana campus like this? And so bringing capital and connectivity through broadband into the First Nations themselves, you're going to give young Indigenous people that vision just a little bit more and a little bit more faster and a little, way more effective to see themselves in the Augustana campus, the U of A campus, the U of C, the University of Lethbridge. So, you know, again, it's broadband, it's foundational, but it's going to lead to way more effective First Nations participation in the economy, in health sectors, in tech sectors, and when First Nations succeed, so does the province of Alberta. So I really thank the province of Alberta, the Premier, um, our two ministers, and everybody for this announcement today. I'm looking forward to the next steps. Hi, hi. And now I'll invite Paul to the podium. He forgot to introduce you. you just no problem, oh, Paul. Bad. Yeah, no yeah, problem, yeah, no problem. I, I've been smiling the whole time. Paul McLaughlin, President of the Rural Municipalities of Alberta. This is a great day. Uh, as President of Rural Municipalities of Alberta, you think I'm talking about agriculture, health, you think I'm talking about policing? Broadband is connected to all those things. We cannot deny the fact that we are connected. And this is a big day for the youth. It's the big day for the rural remote. And much like our Indigenous neighbours and friends, it creates hope for our children. It gives them access to ideas. That's where the innovation is driven. When we electrified rural Alberta, you know what we did is we all did it together. We pitched in. We said, we can build communities where there's not communities now. We can create products and goods for the world market where there are none now. And this is an exciting day for all the folks I represent. The fact is, is that the people I represent when there was a shutdown, children had to go to a Tim Hortons parking lot to do their exams. They had to go to a Tim Hortons, they had to go to the library parking lot to access their schoolwork online. And there is digital poverty in Alberta, but this is a resolution to that. The folks that I represent and the children uh, have experienced this as we've continued through this COVID and the switch has happened. What we're seeing in rural Alberta, much as the minister had said, we're seeing an exodus. I'm the Reva Pinoka County, and the first thing they ask is not how great the governance is, not how low the taxes are. They want to know what access to broadband is available. And we're seeing folks starting to make those lifestyle changes where it's not really actually place, but it's actually ideas and things. And that's what this broadband investment really speaks to. I am so excited on behalf of all the people I represent because this does fight crime. This does deal with health care. This does deal with rural development. This is how you have smart farm, smart ag. This is how we become a world leader, as the Premier and the Ministers have talked about. 
And I'll have to say, this is a great day, and I will continue to smile today. And thank you for the access that we have today. And Minister Glubish, he's been avoiding me a little bit because I keep asking him about this. I finally found him, and I'm glad I found him. So thank you, thank you again, and thank you, Premier. Thanks, everyone. That concludes the formal remarks that we have today. Uh, we're now going to be moving to a media Q&A. For any of our journalists who've joined us here in person, we have a unit mic uh, with Tom standing at the front of it here. Um, and I just ask yourselves to limit yourself to one question, one follow-up. Tom, go ahead. I'll start with, it's either with the Minister or the Premier. $150 million, it's not an insignificant amount of money. Uh, Alberta's a big province. Um, how, how does this work? Does this, you, you talked about leveraging with the private yeah. sector. I think of the TELUS $16 billion. Does it tie in with that? What are we looking at here? Great question. So this is an initial investment. Uh, as Nate said, Alberta was leading the country in rural con connectivity uh, 20 years ago but we really have not invested much in the past 15 years. And so we have to catch up and move forward. This is the beginning of a broader strategy that we've been working on. Um, our goal is to put together about a billion dollar package between us, the feds, and uh, the private sector telecommunications companies. Uh, this is the initial investment that well, we hope will get the ball rolling on that. Um, and so stay tuned. Minister Glubish is in ongoing discussions with the Government of Canada, which has a, a capital fund for uh, rural, remote and in, rural, remote and Indigenous uh, broadband connectivity. Um, we are prepared in principle uh, to put more provincial tax dollars behind this as well. Uh, but we want to see uh, the, the Government of Canada and the private sector step up to the plate uh, in equal measure. So uh, we do appreciate the announcements have been made by uh, companies like TELUS and, and uh, uh, Bell to increase their uh, connectivity in Alberta. And we are supportive in principle of the proposed uh, Rogers-Shaw merger, partly because uh, Rogers is committing as an element of that deal uh, to invest uh, over a billion dollars themselves in building out the 5G network in uh, rural, remote and Indigenous communities. Basically to take some of the spectrum that uh, Shaw has been sitting on uh, for 5G and uh, with the capital depth that that new company would have uh, to, to build out to over and commit over a billion dollars in infrastructure here. So we think some exciting things are, are happening in the private sector already, but we're trying to prime the pump uh, where in, in areas where, where there may not be an economic, uh, a purely market case right now for those companies to invest. And I'll ask uh, Nate to compliment those remarks. Uh, thank you, Premier. And yeah, just to elaborate on that, I've always said all along in the last two years as I've been working on this that that no one level of government can solve this on their own. No individual telecommunications company can solve this on their own. We're going to need all levels of government and all of the private sector to work together to solve this problem. Uh, and it is a big problem. This $150 million announcement today is a huge step forward, an exciting step forward to give some hope to Albertans all across this province that Alberta is uh, on the right track, and uh, and as we continue to work on this important initiative, I will continue my discussions with the federal government and all levels of government and all of the, the telecommunications companies that operate in this province to make sure we uh, work together to finding the best path forward to, to solving this problem. You touched on it during your remarks, but I'm going to ask the question anyway. I think back to the supernet, what was that, 2000, 2001 to 2006, that was a five, six year timeline. Mm -hmm. Is there a timeline on this? Or when, when can our rural Albertans look to say, okay, my kids are going to get high school on this high speed yeah. or something. It's a good question. And at this point in time, it would be premature to speculate on the exact time frame. But what I can tell you is this $150 million announcement, uh, our goal is to get this to work as soon as absolutely possible. Uh, we'll have more to say on that uh, in the weeks to come. For now, we're just going to continue working with uh, all of our partners across multiple levels of government, as well as all of the private sector partners who will actually have a hand in physically building this infrastructure. Uh, and I'm really excited about today's announcement as being our first step forward in a big way, the first step in over 15 years. Right, perfect. Just want to do one more check for any uh, questions on the floor before I move over to the phones. Awesome. Operator, can you please put through our first caller? Jennifer Lee, CBC. Hi, thanks for taking my call. My question is for the Premier, and it's actually related to your government's relationship with nurses right now. Um, you know, there's a, a kind of a growing sentiment among nurses uh, in the province. You know, they say they're feeling disrespected 
even betrayed um, after being on the front lines through the pandemic, three waves of it, facing uh, a wage rollback proposal now. You know, there's talk of a possible strike. You've got a lot of uncertainty in the healthcare system. Right now, we don't know what's happening with the COVID numbers in the months to come. Hospitals are catching up on pandemic-related backlog. You're, you know, your province is dealing with bed closure. Um, given all that, uh, and bargaining, you know, is set to resume in early August, why not, as a government, back away from the idea of a wage rollback? Well, first of all, all Albertans support uh, the fantastic work done by nurses and our other frontline health care workers. Uh, we uh, appreciate so much, especially the work that they've done through the pandemic. And uh, that's one of the reasons we provided the uh, emergency worker top-up payments uh, to just as it recognize some of the extra stress and, and work that many have gone through. Um, many doing overtime hours, of course, uh, particularly in intensive care units. Uh, and uh, that's, this is one of the reasons why we've sought repeatedly to delay uh, the collective bargaining. As you know, um, those agreements, those uh, labor agreements, have a, a time limit on them. And uh, precisely because we've wanted to, to f uh, focus on a pandemic response, we've been seeking to delay collective bargaining. Unfortunately, um, from my perspective, unfortunately, the, the union decided that they did not want any further delays. They wanted the negotiations now. So um, we are responding and negotiating in good faith. Um, we uh, want to ensure that our nurses and other healthcare workers are not just generously compensated, uh, but uh, that they're, we're happy to have them amongst the best compensated in the country. Alberta nervous nurses um, receive on average about 5.6% higher compensation than in the rest of, of Canada. Uh, and as, the, as Dr. McKinnon's panel on Alberta's finances pointed out, uh, we need to make an effort to operate more efficiently, and that includes labor costs uh, in the health system that is nearly 45% of Alberta's budget. Uh, and and uh, the Dr. McKinnon's panel suggested that uh, aiming for uh, the uh, the same level of or similar level of compensation as the other large provinces is a reasonable goal. Um, Alberta has a $16 billion deficit. We've been running massive deficits for a decade. We cannot continue to do that indefinitely. We, this government, at least, is not going to raise taxes uh, to, that would punish people who have already been hurting in the private sector. Uh, so we have to learn how to operate a little more efficiently, and um, that's the basis of our uh, initial position in the collective bargaining agreement. But uh, collective bargaining happens every few years. Uh, governments have a responsibility to uh, defend the interests of taxpayers. Unions have a responsibility to defend the interests of their members. And then you, you negotiate those differences uh, in collective bargaining. That's exactly what's happening now. And Jennifer, do you have a follow-up? I do, thanks. Yeah, I mean, you, you point out there are other ways to uh, make up those uh, shortfalls. Um, as you know, nurses say they feel targeted. But there's also a concern, I think, a growing concern that um, this could have an impact on, on patient care and the healthcare system down the line with nurses saying, you know, they're, they're burnt out. They're looking for jobs either away from the front lines or potentially um, out of the province, as I said, you know, You've got the bed closures. Um, I, I, I'm wondering how you can you respond to concerns that this could have a long-term impact on the healthcare system, on patient care down the line. Well, first of all, I, I, I wouldn't uh, um, agree that people would move uh, from Alberta to receive lower pay in other provinces uh, and to pay higher taxes. That that wouldn't um, add up. Uh, we have more nurses working in Alberta's healthcare system today than ever in our history. We have more physicians working than ever in our history. We are spending more tax dollars on healthcare than ever in our history. The healthcare budget, uh, even without COVID, has gone up by uh, by nearly two billion dollars since uh, this government took office. Um, so Alberta is spending more on healthcare on a per person basis than all than every province in Canada, save one. Uh, we spend about twenty percent more on health care per capita than the average amongst the large provinces, even though we have the youngest population in the country. We compensate our physicians and nurses uh, and other frontline health care workers more generously than in other provinces. Uh, and uh, I anticipate that will continue to be the case. So with a larger budget, more nurses and doctors, 
uh, and generous compensation. This is uh, uh, a sustainable health care system, but we have to have sustainable finances to pay for it. We can't continue to run $10 billion, $20 billion deficits every year because ultimately uh, that will trap us in a sea of debt. Um, we've been there before in Alberta. You might remember back about 25 years ago, the government of Alberta cut spending in the health care system by 20%, shut hospitals, had a 5% wage rollback across the board. We don't want to face those days again. And that's why we need uh, to operate a bit more efficiently uh, as we're seeking to do. All right, thank you. Operator, can you please put through our next caller? Joey Kinney, 660 News. Hey there, this question is for the Premier. Uh, Mr. Premier, you mentioned in a tweet recently that Stampede was the first major event to happen in Canada after the pandemic, and how several health experts have uh, spoken out um, saying that the pandemic is not over, and that's um, a little bit of mixed messaging coming from uh, the province here. So uh, we are not yet into an endemic stage. Uh, do you stand by those comments that the pandemic is over, or is that maybe a little bit premature? Well, as Dr. Hinshaw has said, we are, we are moving from a pandemic to an endemic state of uh, COVID-19. Um, we have seen the numbers come down uh, dramatically in Alberta. We should salute that. You know, uh, I, I think it's time, uh, Frank, let me be blunt, I think it's time for media to stop promoting fear when it comes to uh, COVID-19 and to start actually looking at where we're at with huge vaccine protection. Uh, we have crushed that third spike. COVID continues to exist. As I've said before, it, the virus will continue to circulate. Numbers will go up and they'll go down. But what matters most is that the widespread protective effect of vaccines is real. We should embrace the science. Uh, we should stop listening to people who deny the powerful protective effect of vaccines. What we've seen around the world is that countries with uh, high levels of vaccine coverage across their population have decoupled uh, uh, cases from hospitalizations and fatalities. We never had restrictions in the past uh, to, uh, to stop uh, people from getting uh, my, you know, few or no symptoms. They were there to protect the hospital system, the healthcare system, and prevent large-scale uh, fatalities. So yesterday we had zero COVID fatalities. We now have fewer people in hospital with COVID-19 than at any point in the past nine months. Uh, today, we will achieve 75% first dose protective coverage of the eligible Alberta population. Within a week, we'll hit about 65% fully vaccinated amongst the eligible population. But most importantly, most importantly, uh, about 90% of the vulnerable uh, in Alberta have been vaccinated. That is people over the age of 65. Those are by far the most vulnerable individuals. And uh, that means that um, when COVID case numbers go up, uh, as they will at various times in the future, uh, they will not represent a significant a threat to our healthcare capacity. Um, and so that's why uh, the, the, our chief medical officer uh, had provided advice to drop uh, virtually all public health restrictions uh, once we achieved the thresholds back in June. And I'm very encouraged. Uh, we're now three weeks into that full openness, and I'm very encouraged to see uh, that, w uh, that we continue to do very well. Now, there's no doubt, as I've said before, case numbers will go up in the future, uh, but that should not lead to uh, the same kind of response. It, um, the, w there will be a residual individualized risk for some people. Some people will, will contract COVID, uh, a small number, a uh, sm much smaller percentage of those people than before will be hospitalized and a much smaller percentage than before um, may pass away. But that is true of other diseases um, that we contend with all of the time, like the flu influenza. So I believe that we, uh, uh, we can move forward with confidence, um, uh, of course, using some common sense uh, about uh, basic hygiene and, and staying at home if you're sick, things like that. Uh, but we are very confident about the plan uh, for Alberta to be open for, for uh, uh, as we've done through phase three. And do you have a follow-up at all, Joey? Uh, yeah, I got one more for you here, Mr. Premier. Um, I hear, we're hearing a lot of buzz surrounding Minister Maggi's letter to the federal government regarding the use of pepper spray for self-defense purposes. Um, I'm seeing a lot of uh, buzz on social media. People are uh, very afraid, I guess is the word to use, um, that people are going to be spraying uh, this pepper spray willy-nilly. 
um, and it's going to cause more injuries and more violence. Um, what are your thoughts about the proposed changes to the, to the criminal code there? Well, I think Minister Madu, Madu is absolutely right to say that vulnerable people should be able to protect themselves from uh, random assailants. We've seen a, a terrible spate of uh, violence uh, targeting particularly uh, visible minority individuals, uh, apparently because of their race or religion. And, uh, and many of these things have happened, for example, at uh, transit stops, at, at bus and LRT stops. And uh, if, uh, if, if, for example, a vulnerable woman can have a, a small tool to help defend herself from a violent attack, I think that we should absolutely permit that. Um, obviously, anybody who uses something like that uh, uh, indiscriminately uh, or not not for legitimate self-defense would themselves be uh, potentially liable to, to to assault charges so the law could would the law would continue to be the law but a a a, uh, a, a, a non-lethal tool for individuals to protect themselves from violent attacks I think is perfectly reasonable and you know it's time for the Trudeau government to stop virtue signaling about the issue of hate crimes and to actually crack down on hate crimes. This is a government, the federal Trudeau government, that has widely repealed mandatory minimum prison sentences. We have had cases of vulnerable women attacked in this province in apparent hate crimes by people who went through the revolving door of the justice system and spent no time behind bars. That is unacceptable. And so if the Trudeau government is actually serious about protecting vulnerable people, it will give them the power to, to protect themselves and put the uh, assailants behind bars, create a real meaningful disincentive, send a real message through tough mandatory minimum prison sentences about these kinds of violent hate crimes. Enough talk, it's time for action. That's the message that Minister Madhu is sending. And just before I go to our last caller today, I want to give one more opportunity to any of our uh, journalists gathered today to ask a question in person. Sure. If I can get it, Chief Billy, uh, uh, Paul, we're coming, obviously the, the pandemic restrictions lifted, but over the last year, I assume lots of virtual meetings, lots of virtual co uh, conversations. What's it been like in the last year with the connectivity in your communities and in the communities of the leaders you speak with? <clears throat> Poor. <laughs> so, you know, uh, uh, there's Treaty 6 AGM yesterday and uh, uh, four chiefs couldn't get on because of the connectivity in their nations, you know. Those are some close to the Rocky Mountains, those are some close uh, uh, out by St. Paul. They just can't get on, so it's poor. And, um, you know, I don't know if that's a surprise, I don't know if it was ignored. Um, but again, $150 million gives a little bit of hope today. And, you know, when, when Nate goes to Ottawa, I've been more than happy to help you negotiate with Ottawa with an extra ally to bring even more federal dollars uh, regarding that. So at the end of the day, poor. So today's announcement, I know it'll take a while to build up, but I'm hopeful it'll roll out over the next year. Uh, it can happen soon enough. So at the end of the day, poor. Yeah, it's an excellent question, and I'll be honest with you, there's a few people I've seen recently that I have not seen for a year and a half because they couldn't keep their camera on during a Zoom meeting. Um, there's folks that, well, you know, I talk about parking lot school, going to Tim Hortons. Uh, we have members that are uh, municipal officials that are having to go to a parking lot in order to connect to a meeting. Uh, so this, is, this, is, this conversation is really tied to good governance. It's tied to access to information. It's tied to democracy. Uh, so we are very excited about that. And, and I will uh, second Chief Warren. Uh, I'll go to Ottawa any time uh, to shake the tree because I think that there needs to be a commitment uh, federally too as well. One other comment I'll make too just to t on top of this is the federal government actually interprets rural municipalities in Alberta or rural Alberta. 32% of us have 50-10. And, and I think that the minister attested to it uh, that it, it's, it's closer to 12. Uh, we've been testing our members, it's closer to 9. So only 9% of the members in rural Alberta have 50-10. And that tells you that, again, that digital poverty conversation, and it's really a poverty of justice and democracy. We're getting to a situation that this is a, this is a big problem. So we're glad we can meet again. As the Premier had said, we have opened up the doors. I've shook more hands and I've hugged people that probably didn't want to be hugged in a long time. And it's so exciting to me. Uh, but I think that uh, we need to realize too that we are in a hybrid world now. Uh, the fact is, is that we're going to see the blending of these two meeting systems and that's how governance is going to occur in the future. And I think it'll continue forever too as well. So thank you. All right, thanks Tom. Uh, operator with that, can you please put through our last caller of the day? Janet Friend, CBC. Hi there, thanks for taking my question. It's for the Premier. Uh, some environmental groups 
contacted for participation in the Allen inquiry say the quality of evidence that they were presented with was shoddy, inaccurate, appeared to give credence to conspiracy theories, and appeared rooted in climate change denialism. And in some cases, they were also given just days to review hundreds of pages of material and then supply a response to inform the inquiry. Then they're suggesting that the process was unfair. How confident are you that this inquiry was a good value for Albertans' money and why? Completely confident, and of course they would say that. They don't want the transparency that this commission is bringing. They don't want the public to realize that, that they have been receiving massive amounts of money from foreign sources to shut down the largest job-creating industry in Canada. This government was elected on a clear mandate uh, to uh, fight back for our energy and resource workers, uh, which, by the way, the energy sector is the largest employer of Indigenous people in Canada by a country mile. 800,000 Canadians, their livelihoods depend directly or indirectly on energy jobs. And we have faced tens of millions of dollars being dumped into our politics and courts by foreign foundations. And let me call out the hypocrisy. You know, the same U.S. administration that vetoed the uh, Keystone XL pipeline, which would have provided upwards of 900,000 barrels of uh, responsibly produced Canadian energy to the U.S., that very same administration has lifted sanctions on Vladimir Putin's Russian autocracy in their construction of the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline to, West, uh, to Western Europe, which undermines uh, uh, Ukraine, a country invaded by Vladimir Putin. The Biden administration is lifting sanctions on uh, the uh, investment in, Ven in the Venezuelan, Venezuelan oil fields being run by a socialist dictatorship. The same administration is lifting sanctions on Iran's oil and gas exports, a theocratic dictatorship that spreads violence and terrorism around the world. But we have U.S. foundations uh, campaigning in Canada with U.S. dollars to block Canadian pipelines from this rights-respecting liberal democracy. Albertans and Canadians have every right to be upset about that and to seek transparency, which is why we kept our election commitment uh, to appoint a uh, public inquiry into the foreign sources of funds behind the campaign to landlock Canadian energy. And I can understand the caterwauling from those foreign-funded special interests. They don't want the transparency. They don't want the, the disinfectant of transparency the, uh, to, to come down on that. Uh, that's why they went to court. And, and, and it's just a classic tactic on their part tried to kill the inquiry. Well, thankfully, uh, the Court of Queen's Bench uh, threw their case out. And uh, Albertans, have, Albertans have every right to seek transparency. Uh, as we are doing, we were elected to do that, and we're keeping our commitment. Do you have a follow-up at all, Jana? Yeah, unrelated. So, Lac St. Anne County t today has declared a state of agricultural disaster. Uh, I'm curious what what in information you have about the magnitude of agricultural damage so far this year from drought and um, what sort of further steps you're planning on taking to mitigate that. Well, the current estimate made by the Department of Agriculture is that we're looking at uh, both as of t this week, about 30 percent of Alberta crops being rated good. Uh, quality as opposed to about 70 uh, percent last year. So there's no doubt there has been uh, widespread damage to crops across the province. We're also concerned about the uh, indirect impact this will have on livestock producers because it reduces availability of feed. And so uh, that is why we, we are, we've worked with the other prairie provinces uh, and the federal government to access uh, agri-stability uh, emergency payments um, the last time we saw a drought of this nature was, I think, in 2001, and the total cost of payments that, that year were in the range of about a billion dollars uh, to, to help ag producers get through uh, that situation. Um, and we'll, we may be making an announcement in the very near future about uh, working with uh, livestock producers so that they can access some of these damaged crops so that they're, uh, we can at least harvest uh, some of, use some of the nutritional value so those crops aren't just uh, plowed under. Uh, I'll invite Minister um, Horner to, to add to that as the Minister for Rural Economic Development. Uh, yes, thank you. I, I would just add, uh, we've, we've all been uh, uh, giving uh, Minister Dreeshen 
as much feedback as we can what we're, what we're hearing on the ground. Uh, it is very widespread. Um, there are pockets that, that look okay, but uh, some areas that have been dealing with too much moisture over the last few years uh, now find themselves in the, in the same situation as a lot of the south. Uh, I know the federal ag minister is in Manitoba today meeting with ag industry groups. Um, all indications are that the ag recovery uh, federal provincial uh, program uh, will be uh, implemented shortly and I think we'll have more details to follow but uh, it's top, top of mind for everyone and uh, look forward to some, uh, some better news about support and uh, how we're going to help both the livestock uh, and, and crop producers in the province. So thank you. All right, thanks everyone. That concludes today's program.